or fiction. A recording of the webinar will be posted on the website later this week. And please type in your questions into the chat box in the panel. The questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Let me introduce Dennis Brager. Dennis is a California State Bar Certified Tax Specialist and a former senior, senior tax attorney for the Internal Revenue Services Office of Chief Counsel. He is a regular speaker at the UCLA Tax Controversy Institute and has been retained as an expert witness in both federal and state courts. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you, Barbara, and uh, thank everybody uh, out there in, um, in Internet land for uh, visiting with us this morning. So as you've been uh, promised, we're going to talk about innocent spouse relief, fact or fiction. Uh, and so to uh, eliminate any suspense, uh, it is a fact, it is not fiction. Uh, and that's the end of our seminar today. No, just joking. Uh, we have, uh, when we talk about innocent spouse relief, there are actually three different kinds of, of innocent spouse relief. Uh, what I refer to as traditional innocent spouse relief, uh, under IRC Section 6015B. I call it traditional innocent spouse relief because this was the only type of innocent spouse relief that was available uh, before the amendment of the law in 1998. And it's a fairly difficult uh, road to go down. Generally speaking, one of the other two forms of innocent spouse relief uh, are going to be more likely to be to be granted. The second type is the so-called spousal allocation rules of Section 6015C. And generally speaking, if you manage to qualify, that's the uh, that's the easiest route to go. And then finally, we have equitable relief under code section 6015F. And we're going to be talking a little bit about all three types of relief today and you know what the differences are and what the qualifications are. There are a few items that run through all three types of innocent spouse relief. Uh, no matter what type of innocent spouse relief you're requesting, uh, you're going to need to jump through these particular hoops. And so first of all, uh, and perhaps obviously or perhaps not because the question comes up in my practice, um, you need a joint tax return. As you probably know, when two spouses sign a joint tax return, they both become jointly and severally liable for the uh, for the tax that's due on the return. So if there's no joint return, there's no joint and several liability, uh, no innocent spouse relief, and generally no need for innocent spouse relief. And as I point out in the slide, if one spouse's signature was forged, then there's no joint return. Uh, however, in some cases, the courts have said that even though there was the uh, one spouse didn't sign the return or her signature was forged, uh, that the person acquiesced uh, in the filing of the joint return. And therefore, even without a signature, uh, one can have a, a joint return. Now, before you go running off and saying there's, there's no joint return and arguing uh, with the IRS because you know your client didn't didn't sign uh, you have to consider because we're here in California uh, the implications of community property laws and what I mean by that is if you take the position that the uh, your client didn't sign the return and therefore there's no joint return the next question that arises is well uh, that's fine there's no joint return but now there are two separate returns due, and each of the spouses is supposed to report one half of the community property, which 
includes uh, the other party's salary or other income on your client's tax return. And that may be a much worse situation than simply uh, agreeing that there's a joint return and then qualifying for innocent spouse relief. So you have to sort of think your way through that before you uh, take a position. Innocent spouse relief only applies to income tax. So for example, it doesn't apply to trust fund recovery penalties. It doesn't apply to uh, foreign bank account penalties. And when you think about it, that makes sense because the trust fund recovery penalty and the FBAR penalties, those are all based upon individual actions. So if, you know, if the husband, and by the way, not to be too sexist about it, but generally speaking, virtually, I don't want to say virtually all, but um, I was just actually reading a statistical study in, in preparation for this webinar, uh, and the statistics are that something like 80 or 85 percent of innocent spouses are, are women. So I'm not going to try and be gender neutral here today. Um, but the point is is that if the uh, if a if a husband uh, fails to pay payroll taxes in his, in his corporation, the penalty is going to be assessed against him. It's not going to be assessed against the wife unless the wife was uh, also uh, a responsible party. Okay. Uh, next item that we need to have in order to have innocent spouse relief of any kind is we need to make a timely election. And the election gets made by filing this uh, IRS form 8857, and that is the form that gets filled out uh, in which you explain why your client is entitled to innocent spouse relief. And there's a variety of, of questions on, on that form that need to be uh, filled out and, again, filed. The election needs to be timely. And it depends what section of the code you're proceeding under. So if you're under 6015 B or C, that is uh, traditional relief or spousal allocation, then it must be made within two years of the IRS's first collection activity. Collection activity does not include uh, simply sending out uh, various collection notices. It does, however, include the offset by the IRS of a tax refund um, that belongs to the requesting spouse. And this is something that's problematic because sometimes people uh, have their uh, refunds withheld, uh, applied to a prior tax liability. Maybe the refund is small. The person you know, just sort of doesn't think about it, doesn't attend to it. And all of a sudden, two years have gone by, and it's too late to uh, file for innocent spouse under 6015B or C. Uh, the good news is that under, under F, the equitable provisions, the statute of limitations uh, on file, or the time for filing a claim is the same as the statute of limitations on collection, which is generally 10 years from the from the date of the uh, assessment of the tax. So therefore, if the IRS is still able to collect from your client, uh, she'll still be able to file under Section 6015F. All right, so let's talk about the spousal allocation rules. And as I mentioned before, uh, this is the if you can qualify under C, this is definitely the way to go. And it allows the electing spouse to allocate the deficiency in proportion to each, each spouse's contribution to the deficiency. So basically what that means is that if 100% of the tax deficiency is due to the husband's unreported salary, for example, then you would be the requesting spouse, the wife would be entitled to 
relief from 100% of the deficiency liability. Um, in determining how you allocate between the spouses, you ignore community property laws. So even as we just talked about, uh, even though as we just talked about, the uh, salary is community property, 50% husband, 50% wife. Uh, in this case, it's allocated to the person who earned it. Now, this election, spousal allocation may only be made who at the time of the election is not married, is legally separated from the other spouse, or is not a member of the same household for a 12-month period. So you have to watch your timing here. You may have to wait uh, to file your request for relief under 6015C. Now, the one thing that will get a person uh, knocked out of the spousal allocation rules is if the IRS can show that the requesting spouse had actual knowledge at the time the return was signed that uh, of the of the deficiency. Um, and in that situation, relief is, is not available. Now, the burden of proof is on the IRS to demonstrate that the requesting spouse had actual knowledge, not simply reason to know of the deficiency, but actual knowledge. And as I ask here somewhat rhetorically, uh, actual knowledge of what? And basically, it's, it's knowledge of, of those facts which put the person on notice that there is a deficiency. So let me see if I can uh, try and make that a little bit clearer. So, for example, if a, um, if a spouse has knowledge of the fact that there was omitted income, okay, uh, the person knew that their husband did not report all of their income on their tax return, that would be actual knowledge. Now, if on the other hand, they simply, you know, knew that they were living a, uh, a high lifestyle um, and but didn't realize that the reason for that was because uh, income was not being reported on the tax return, then they don't have actual knowledge. So it's, it's really pretty easy, as I say, to get um, relief under the spousal allocation rules, provided that you can, that the parties are divorced or, or separated, and that the timing is right. Um, we then can move on to 6015B, traditional innocent spouse relief. Uh, this is the most difficult form of relief to obtain. And it requires that in signing the return, the re requesting spouse did not know or had no reason to know that there was an understatement of tax on the return. So if, for example, uh, and to go back to what I was talking about previously, if what happened was that um, the husband didn't report all of the income, but the wife, in inspecting the tax return, saw that only $50,000 of income had been reported, yet they were living in a mansion in, in Beverly Hills, uh, and the wife wasn't aware of, let's say, savings that it could have come out of, or an inheritance, or something like that then most, most probably the court would say that she had reason to know 
that there was an understatement on the return. I want to point out that both in traditional innocent spouse relief as well as spousal allocation that we talked about before, it's not available in non-payment cases. It's only available for deficiency cases. So what I mean by that is, is that if at the time the return is filed, uh, everything is properly reported, but there's an amount due and that does not get submitted with the return, that's a non-payment case. As opposed to a deficiency case in which the return is filed, the tax is paid in full, but the IRS comes in, there's an audit, and the IRS determines that there's a deficiency. It's only in these deficiency cases that you can use uh, traditional innocent spouse relief or, for that matter, spousal allocation. Uh, you would be limited in the non-payment cases to applying for relief under Section 6015F. Which brings us to equitable relief, and that's what we're going to spend the most time on today because, one, uh, it's the most complicated, uh, and, and two, as I said, it's the only kind if your client uh, has filed a return and there's a non-payment, this is what you're left with. By the way, another advantage of 6015F is that um, in certain situations, it is possible to get a refund of amounts that have been collected by the IRS. Uh, that's also available under 6015D. It is not available under the spousal allocation rules. The IRS, um, late last year, issued a brand new revenue procedure, 2013-34. And this is extremely important, and if you have an innocent spouse case, then you need to find this revenue procedure and make your way through it in all its exquisite detail. Uh, it outlines the, the conditions for obtaining equitable relief, and the tax court relies heavily on the IRS's revenue procedures. Uh, revenue procedure 2013-34 uh, is the successor, shall we say, to a notice that was issued by the IRS during 2012 in which they set forth pretty much the same um, set of factors in determining innocent spouse. Prior to that, there were a couple of earlier revenue procedures which outlined the, uh, the parameters for obtaining innocent spouse relief. And 2013-34 is much more liberal than either of the earlier revenue procedures. And so when you read the, the tax court cases, that are going through the various uh, factors, you have to be careful because those cases uh, may not be correct anymore because they rely on various factors which are no longer uh, important or being interpreted in a different way. So in order for one to get equitable relief, there are certain threshold conditions that have to be met. And those threshold conditions are set forth here. You have the joint return. You have to show that there's no relief available under either of the other two sections. You have to have filed timely. You also have to show that no assets were transferred between the spouses of part, as part of a fraudulent scheme. Uh, so if the parties were to uh, you know, have some sort of an arrangement where uh, the wife transfers everything, all the, all the marital property to the husband, there's no consideration for it, 
uh, and then the wife goes and you know files for innocent spouse relief with the idea that well in the future uh, they'll get back together the husband will support her um, that's a fraudulent scheme and not surprisingly uh, a person in that situation would not be entitled to innocent spouse relief We also have to make sure that there were no disqualified assets that were transferred uh, to the requesting spouse. In general, this applies to assets transferred um, at the very last minute, uh, you know, uh, immediately before an audit. Uh, part of the threshold conditions also include uh, the, the requesting spouse couldn't have participated in the filing of a fraudulent return. And, and this is the most important one, the final one, uh, the income tax liability on which the requesting spouse is trying to obtain relief must be attributable in whole or in part to an item of the non-requesting spouse or an underpayment resulting from the non-requesting spouse's income. So uh, let's try and work on an example of that. If if the return, if a joint return was filed, and let's say that the husband had $100,000 worth of uh, self-employment income, and the wife had $100,000 worth of uh, W-2 wages, and let's say that no tax was paid with the with the return or, or subsequently for that matter in that case the deficiency I'm sorry the the non-payment is attributable 50% uh, to the husband and 50% to the wife uh, because neither of them have uh, have made any any payments and therefore uh, the wife would only be uh, allowed to obtain relief with respect to 50% of the income tax liability. Once the threshold conditions have been met, the next question is whether or not uh, we can get what they referred to as a streamlined determination. And if we can do a streamlined determination, that's easier uh, because there are a lot of factors that don't need to be considered. There's, there's a limited number of factors. So first of all, uh, the, the first qualification is, is that the parties are no longer married. And by married, here we mean married, uh, no longer married, or if they're legally separated, or if the requesting spouse has not been a member of the same household for uh, 12 months uh, preceding the filing of the election. In addition, you would have to show that the requesting spouse would suffer economic hardship if relief were not granted. And you have to show that the requesting spouse did not know or have reason to know that there was an understatement of deficiency or understatement where deficiency on the joint return uh, or did not know or have reason to know that the non-requesting spouse would not or could not pay the underpayment of tax reported on the joint income tax return. So here again you have one of these reason to know tests. And as is pointed out in the slide, this condition doesn't need to be met if there was abuse by the non-requesting spouse or the non-requesting spouse maintained control over the household finances by restricting access to financial information. And this abuse as uh, bearing on the other factors is a theme that you'll see repeated throughout the, uh, the equitable relief provisions. And the abuse issue um, has been raised to a greater level of awareness by this uh, latest uh, revenue procedure 2013-34. Abuse was always a factor, but, and we'll talk about this a little bit uh, more, 
but abuse has become a very significant uh, and perhaps overriding factor in the in innocent spouse determinations, uh, especially equitable innocent spouse. Now, let's assume for a moment that it's not possible for your client to obtain streamlined innocent spouse relief. If, if that doesn't work, then we have to go to, these, uh, to the non-streamlined determination. And this is a list of each of the factors that's considered by the IRS in determining whether or not to grant equitable innocent spouse relief. So as you can see, we have marital status, economic hardship, knowledge, abuse, legal obligations, significant benefit, compliance with uh, the income tax laws, and mental or physical health of the requesting spouse. And we're going to talk about each one of these in a little more detail. Now, the IRS points out, and the courts have as well, that uh, no factor is controlling. Uh, the factors are classified as favorable, unfavorable, or neutral. And you don't simply add up the factors. In other words, if there's, uh, I believe, eight factors, uh, you don't say, okay, uh, we have, we're favorable on five and unfavorable on four, so therefore we get innocent spouse treatment. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, it's not clear exactly how it does work. Um, because it's one of these sort of squishy facts and circumstances tests. And if the IRS or the courts is, is convinced that uh, it would be inequitable, because you have to keep coming back to that touchstone, whether or not it would be inequitable to hold the requesting spouse liable. And it's, the IRS has enunciated all these factors and tests and everything. But at the end of the day, uh, it's still a determination as to whether or not it would be inequitable to hold that person liable. So the first one is marital status. So if the parties are legally separated, divorced, widowed, uh, or not part of the same household, then this is favorable to the requesting spouse. If these tests aren't met, uh, then it's merely neutral. It's not unfavorable. We then have economic hardship. So if there's economic hardship, that's a favorable factor. But now, it used to be unfavorable if there was a lack of economic hardship. But now, under the uh, Revenue Procedure 2013-34, the lack of economic hardship is simply neutral. And what do we mean by economic hardship? Well, basically that means being unable to pay one's current uh, basic living expenses. And as usual, you know, the IRS and the uh, taxpayer usually have a different idea of what it means uh, to be able to pay, you know, basic living expenses. A treasury regulation section 301.6343, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is up here on the screen, uh, sets out how one makes a determination, and what it says is that it will vary according to, quote, the unique circumstances of the individual taxpayer. However, uh, unique circumstances don't include the maintenance of what the regulation calls an affluent or luxurious standard of living, whatever that might mean. And the regulations instruct uh, the IRS to look at a variety of factors in determining uh, basic living expenses. 
And so uh, re the regulation instructs us to look at the taxpayer's age, employment status, ability to earn, the number of dependents. Uh, it also tells us to look at an amount reasonably necessary for food, clothing, housing, medical expenses, transportation, current tax payments, alimony, child support, uh, and expenses necessary to the taxpayer's production of income, such as uh, dues uh, or child care, child care payments, which allow the taxpayers to be gainfully employed. Uh, the regulation instructs us to look at the cost of living in the geographic area in which the taxpayer resides. Um, it also mentions extraordinary circumstances such as a medical catastrophe uh, or special education expenses and a catch-all. Any other factor that the taxpayer claims bears on economic hardship and brings to the attention of the IRS. Um, so generally speaking, you're going to have to prepare a financial statement for the client to show how it is that they would be, uh, why there's an economic hardship, why their expenses uh, eat up all of their all of their income, and if you can demonstrate this convincingly, then you will have satisfied this economic hardship fact. Um, and I will tell you that. Uh, the courts, the tax court in particular, has been, uh, you know, more flexible than the IRS as to what constitutes economic hardship. Um, the courts, the tax court has looked at older clients in their 60s, uh, even I think as young as mid-50s. Uh, they have retirement accounts, not huge, but you know, I've seen cases, 50, 60, 70, $100,000 of uh, retirement accounts, and the IRS has argued, oh, well, they could, you know, take the money out of the re retirement account and pay off the, uh, you know, the tax debt, and therefore there's no economic hardship. And the court has, at least in some instances, said, no, um, you know, for somebody of a certain age, it's, uh, it's reasonable for them to have a, a, a modest retirement account and to deplete, to deplete that would create an economic hardship. Okay, let's move on to the next factor, which is knowledge. And this one is generally either favorable or unfavorable. And I mentioned that knowledge is not what I call a super factor. And the reason I say that is because under some of the earlier revenue procedures, uh, if you had knowledge of, of the uh, understatement, then it was weighted more heavily than any of the other factors. And the IRS has dropped this, and the revenue procedure makes clear that uh, the knowledge is, is not itself more important than any of the other factors. So again, knowledge of what? Uh, first of all, it's an understatement case that did not know and had no reason to know of the understatement. In underpayment cases, it's whether the requesting spouse knew or had reason to know at the time she filed signed the joint return that the other spouse would not or could not pay the tax liability at the time the return was filed or within a reasonably prompt period of time after the filing of the joint return. As you can see, uh, there's a special rule there which says that if the request for an installment agreement was filed 90 days after the due date uh, or within, I should say, 90 days after the due date, then the spouse will be presumed not to know of the non-payment. Now, where clients get 
tripped up on this requirement a lot is where there's been a history of non-filing. So, I'm sorry, non-payment. So, for example, 2010, the return is filed, payment doesn't go in. 2011, return is filed, payment doesn't go in. 2012, same thing. Uh, now the client comes in and says, well, gee, I didn't know that my husband wasn't going to pay the tax. Uh, you know, he was the one who uh, would always mail in the return, and I just, you know, assumed that, that he was going to, you know, send in the, send in the check. Well, maybe that works okay for the, for the first year, for 2010. But by the time the 2011 return is being filed, then the IRS is going to say, well, look, uh, you were getting all these notices in the mail saying that the tax hadn't been paid. So in, in 2011, when the return wasn't filed, uh, you had a duty to look a little closer as to whether or not the check was actually going in. Um, and if you didn't do that, then you had reason to know, at least for the 2011 and 2012 years, that uh, that this uh, that this liability might not get paid. You had reason to know. Another thing that trips requesting spouses up sometimes is the IRS will ask uh, to look at bank statements. Was there enough money in the accounts, in the joint accounts that the spouse, that the wife had access to, that she should have known that this tax couldn't be paid? So, tax return gets filed. It says at the bottom there's a hundred thousand dollars due. The wife has access to all the joint accounts, and there's only ten thousand dollars in it on October fifteenth. Well. The wife, according to the IRS, should have known uh, that the that the return or that the payment wasn't going to get paid. And this has been uh, a big sticking point in a couple of cases that that we've dealt with. And you have to be careful because you know usually what the requesting spouse the, the knee-jerk reaction is to say uh, is, is to start talking about how bad things were economically, uh, but paradoxically, if things were that bad uh, economically, then you knew or had reason to know that the tax wasn't going to get paid, and you're going to um, have this cla uh, classified as an unfavorable factor. There's a laundry list of, of items that the IRS looks at in evaluating uh, whether or not has uh, the requesting spouse has reason to know. Uh, they look at the person's level of education. They look at whether uh, the non-requesting spouse was evasive as to finances and to what was going on. Uh, they look at the requesting spouse's degree of involvement. Uh, they look at the requesting spouse's involvement in the business and household financial matters. Is this uh, the type of marriage where the wife uh, gets an uh, gets an allowance and you know she's given money for groceries uh, and uh, you know, but the husband is the one who pays the rent, uh, you know, or pays the mortgage and generally keeps control over over all of the bills. And the IRS also looks at uh, the requesting spouse's business or financial expertise. So if the wife is, uh, let's say, a lawyer or an accountant, uh, then the IRS and perhaps the court is going to tend to assume that well, gee, you should have known that this wasn't get paid. You're a sophisticated, you know, business person, uh, and um, and you should have known. On the other hand, if uh, you know the wife has a high school education, 
uh, has spent her uh, adult life, you know, raising her children and um, being in a traditional housewife role, then it's more likely that she's not going to have reason to know. All right, as I say here, more factors. I warned you that this was uh, a much more complicated area. So abuse, abuse by the non-requesting spouse. Um, if the requesting spouse has been abused, this is a favorable factor. I mentioned that I've been looking at some uh, a study with some statistics in it, and I, again, forget the exact numbers, but where the tax court has accepted and believed that the requesting spouse was abused, in something like, I want to say like 80 or 85 percent of those cases, the requesting spouse does receive innocent spouse treatment. So if abuse exists, this is an extremely important factor to stress. Uh, yeah, to stress. Uh, the revenue procedure points out that abuse can be both psychological or emotional as well as physical. Uh, it recognizes that the non-requesting spouse's alcohol or drug abuse may be uh, a factor here. And the, the problem in the abuse, with, with the abuse factor, is trying to prove to the satisfaction uh, of the IRS that abuse has actually occurred. And, you know, the, the IRS management, I think, is, is trying to encourage their people to become more sensitive to this issue, but uh, abuse is uh, something where there are many times there, there are not any witnesses to it. Um, you know, the only witnesses may be, for example, uh, the, the children. And generally speaking, uh, you know, the requesting spouse, the wife, is, is not going to want to, you know, get her children involved in, in this kind of thing. So it can sometimes be difficult to prove uh, that abuse occurred. Sometimes uh, expert testimony from a treating uh, mental health professional is helpful. Uh, sometimes there are, are friends that, that the abuse spouses confided in, those kinds of declarations may be helpful, um, but it, it can be a battle. If there's, um, if a police report has been filed, uh, that's, uh, that's certainly helpful. Um, anything that you can think of that might show objective evidence in addition to uh, the requesting spouse's testimony, uh, you need to track that down. Next factor is legal obligation. So uh, this factor weighs in favor of relief if the non-requesting spouse has the sole legal obligation to pay the outstanding liability as set forth in a divorce decree or other agreement. Um, it will weigh against relief if the requesting spouse is the one with sole legal obligation, but if both spouses have a legal obligation to pay the outstanding tax, uh, uh, or if they're not, not separated or divorced, or the divorce decree uh, is silent, then this factor becomes neutral. Significant benefit, uh, whether, the, whether the spouse um, whether the requesting spouse received significant benefit uh, from the unpaid income tax liability or the item giving rise to the deficiency. And significant benefit, you look at uh, things like uh, expensive vacations. Sometimes uh, the IRS has argued that private school tuition for the children is a significant benefit, uh, and uh, this this factor can also be problematic. Another one, another factor 
to look at is that the IRS looks at is compliance with the income tax laws. Uh, whether the requesting spouse has a good, made a good faith effort uh, to get their tax returns filed in the subsequent years, uh, whether they've paid all the taxes, this is, imp this is important in the eyes of the IRS. And then finally, there's mental or physical health, whether the requesting spouse was in poor uh, physical or, or mental health. Uh, if they are, that can be a, a, a favorable factor. So that's, you know, sort of it on 6015F. Uh, obviously, we've only had a chance to scratch the surface. But again, my, my suggestion is if you have one of these cases, the first thing you need to do is, is read that revenue procedure several times. Let me talk briefly here about the process of appealing an adverse decision from the IRS. So the first thing that will happen is the IRS will issue a notice of preliminary determination. Uh, and if it's favorable, great. You're, you're home free, although the, uh, the non-requesting spouse is given an opportunity to uh, object to that notice of preliminary determination, and they can uh, appeal that and argue that the IRS initial determination was incorrect. But generally speaking, um, if the decision is favorable, then, then you can move on. If it's unfavorable, you have 30 days to file a protest with the IRS's appeals division. The other option, and depending upon the case, uh, you may be able to exercise multiple options, uh, is to file a tax court petition. And you can file a tax court petition under a few circumstances. But the first is, let's say you file a protest, you go to appeals, appeals disagrees with you, then a final notice of determination will be issued by the appeals division. And you can petition that, uh, you can file a petition with the court. You have 90 days to do that after that final notice is issued. The other possibility is that once you file the initial request, if six months go by and there has not been a final determination, then you have the option of immediately filing a tax court petition and skipping the um, waiting either for the preliminary notice or waiting for appeals. Another way you can get tax court review is that it can be filed in connection with a substantive deficiency determination. So for example, uh, you know, there's the IRS comes in, they audit. Uh, there's disagreement about whether or not the underlying determination has been is is correct. Uh, the husband and wife file for uh, from the issuance of a notice of deficiency, and the wife says, "Well, um, I don't think that either of us owe this money." However, if we owe this money, I'm an innocent spouse, and it can be litigated in that context. In any event, the tax court's review is de novo, and the standard of review is de novo, meaning that uh, the court can receive evidence that was not submitted to appeals or to the IRS previously, and the court reviews the case without regard to the IRS's determination. And this is very significant because the IRS had been arguing for years and years that if you didn't submit the information to the IRS beforehand in the context of its review, you could not submit new evidence to the tax court. Um, and also that if the IRS had made an adverse determination that the IRS 
I'm sorry, that the court should only review that determination for abuse of discretion. And that issue has been litigated for years. And finally, uh, the Ninth Circuit uh, held in favor of the taxpayers, and the IRS agreed that it would no longer litigate this, this issue. Innocent spouse defenses can also be raised as uh, part of a collection due process hearing. Uh, and there's also a provision that if an innocent spouse has, or I should say, a person has filed for innocent spouse treatment and it was rejected, there is a possibility for obtaining uh, reconsideration of that, of that decision at a later date. Uh, and that includes a right to go to appeals on the reconsideration. But there is, however, no right to go to tax court unless you uh, have a timely appeal of an initial innocent spouse relief request. Okay, so we have a few questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take those. Uh, I'll, I'll take the easiest one. First, is there a way we can get a copy of the slides? And the answer is yes. Uh, we're going to post them up on our website, BragerTaxLaw.com, and uh, probably give us uh, about 48 hours for them to, to get up there. The other two questions, I'm afraid, are a, are, are a little general. Um, so let me see if I can think of a way to answer them. Uh, one is, uh, if somebody says, I deal with mediating family law matters, so it would be great if you could address some things of concern to issues that arise in that context. Uh, well, seeing as I don't mediate family law matters, I'm not 100% sure what arises in, in that context. But, uh, you know, I mean, generally speaking, uh, the, the parties need to understand that whatever agreement they come to in the mediation uh, as to the treatment of the taxes, if I'm assuming for a moment the taxes are owed, um, they need to understand that whatever agreement they come to, the IRS is not bound by that agreement. Uh, and it would be helpful if the parties could also agree in the mediation uh, if the you know, if the husband is is willing to, uh, you know, support the wife in in her seeking of, of innocent spouse, uh, you know, that can be, you know, a very big help rather than, as in some cases, having the ex-husband uh, lobbing hand grenades uh, into into the process and doing um, his best to try and prevent the you know the wife from from getting innocent spouse treatment and it seems to me that in those cases where uh, the husband is agreeing in the in the mediation that he's going to be solely responsible for the taxes then he also ought to be in agreement that um, that he at, at a minimum wouldn't object to the IRS and perhaps that he might agree to provide uh, declarations in support of, of innocent spouse treatment, assuming, of course, that uh, he's got possession of facts which, which would be helpful to the wife. So I think that's, you know, those are things that, that occur to me. Um, and the other question is, uh, are there steps a soon-to-be-divorced spouse can take as a preemptive measure? Well, I would say that, you know, one of the most important things that, that one can do is to make sure that before you leave the marital premises that you have, uh, you know, records. You know, a lot of times uh, clients come to me and 
you know, they don't even have the, uh, the tax returns that were filed, and we have to track them down. Sometimes we have to get them uh, from the IRS, which, which can take, take months. Um, you know, if, if a, uh, a spouse is, is subject to abuse, um, then a preemptive measure would include the filing police reports. What else um, can can one do as a preemptive measure? Well, I think that you know. Again, I think uh, preemptively. Uh, I suppose the first thing one could do is make sure the taxes get paid. Uh, that that would be the, the best preemptive measure. Um, I just got a, another question that says, timely payments, can this prevent the IRS from going after the other party? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand that. Timely payments. Um, I'm guessing that this refers to, to timely payments on an installment agreement. Dennis? Uh, actually, yeah. that's a half of one question. The question is, if one party agrees to not only support the wife and innocent spouse relief, but agrees to be solely responsible for the entire unpaid tax, and then the, the rest of the question, and to, to make, make timely, timely payments. payments, can this prevent the IRS from going after the other party? The, the short answer is no. I mean, um, the fact that in the divorce decree, one party agrees to be solely responsible, that has no binding impact on the IRS whatsoever. Um, and the IRS is, in the first instance, they're going to come to the other spouse and say, okay, you know, we're getting payments of a thousand dollars a month on this liability from your from your ex, but what we want to know is, you know, do you have uh, assets from which you could pay us in full? Um, and unless you can show that uh, that the uh, that the person is an innocent spouse and you jump through all of the hoops that we've been discussing for the last fifty minutes, uh, the IRS is going to say, well, this is interesting, you know that. Uh, the the ex is making payments, but that doesn't begin to solve the problem. So, all right, um, I've uh, overstayed the time. We said it was going to be 50 minutes. We're bumping up on an hour. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, thank all of you for attending today. As I said, we're going to post the uh, post the slides and. Uh, I'm available for you know some some short follow-up questions uh, if you if you want to send me an email and if I can be of any help uh, my information is is up on your screen and if you are uh, on this call you probably get my emails etc so you know where to find me uh, again thank you very much <laughs>